Good evening. It is 7 p.m. and I will call the meeting to order. If we could please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and thank you. Welcome to the February 13th, 2023 business meeting of the Milford Board of Education. Ms. Griffin, can we have a roll call for attendance, please? Catherine Alling. Uh, Ms. Alling is absent. She's excused. Adam DeYoung. Here. Megan Doyle. Here. Andrew Fowler. Here. Tracy Irby. Here. Emily McDonough-Souza. Here. Gary Pellicetti. Here. Una Petrosky. Here. Cindy Wolf Boynton. Here. And Susan Glennon. Here. Nine members present. Thank you. Student reports. I believe Boring goes first this evening. How are you tonight? Good. Yeah, how are you? I'm good, thanks. So, good evening, everyone. It's been an incredible month here at Warren, and we are so excited to share it with you. So, to begin, a huge congratulations to our National, National Honor Society and the Tri M Music Honor Society. We are so grateful for, for our Milford community support for the visual and performing arts. We had 13 NAHS students and 22 Tri M students. I was grateful to participate in the citywide Model U United Nations Conference on Tuesday, January 10th. This conference represents the culmination of the work students have been doing in the Model U classroom all semester, learning about the various organs of the United Nations, researching world problems and specific countries' perspectives, writing position papers, debating, and ultimately voting on solutions to modern day issues. So it truly was an incredible course to take that I personally learned so much. The Health Professions Club welcomed Mr. Lou Elmo, an occupational therapist and adjunct professor at Quincyac University and Sacred Heart University, and he is also a foreign parent. He went to the Health Professions Club and taught the students about the role of an occupational therapist, as well as demonstrated how to use various assistive devices when working with the patients. On February 15th, a representative from our community college will be at Forum and will assist our seniors with submitting their applications. And this is a great opportunity for any and all seniors. On March 16th, 8.30 to 9.30, students will be able to register to vote if they are or turn 18 before election day. And tickets for our school musical Legally Blonde just became available. Save the dates, March 3rd, 4th, and a matinee on the 5th. Students in interior design for the new semester created mood boards to introduce themselves to their classmates. A gallery walk was used to identify different classmates' themes, aesthetics, and overall vibes. So in AP Psychology, students in Mr. Williams' class applied John Piaget's cognitive development theory by participating in the dating game, Piaget style, as a part of their de developmental psychology unit four. It was a very interesting class, all to see which developmental stage was on the rose. Two of our seniors, Christian Bouteau and Nicholas Agresti, were honored at the Connecticut Soccer Coaches Association Class M All-State Dinner, along with their coach, Pietre, for assistant coach of the year. Congratulations. Last month, alongside 2,000 students across Connecticut, I entered Senator Murphy's Martin Luther King essay contest, where I wrote about MLK and how his achievements were interwoven with my hopes. This weekend, I was honored to receive an award and represent the 3rd Congressional District of Connecticut alongside 14 other winners of all grades. The essays will be on display in his office. Lastly, students in all levels of French form are starting to fill in their brackets for a mini musical, I don't speak French, a French language song competition where singing and dancing are strongly encouraged. The enthusiasm and engagement from this exciting project will be contagious as students pick their favorite songs and cheer them on in the competition. All right, so good evening, everyone. I'm excited to share with you some more of the great events that happened at Forum throughout the past month. So to start, senior Madeline Elmo won the VFW Voice of Democracy contest and was invited to read her essay in front of members of the VFW. Since 1947, the Voice of Democracy has been the veteran of Foreign, uh, of Foreign Wars' premier scholarship program, giving out more than $2 million in scholarships. Congratulations to Madeline. Also last month, seniors Joe Gaetano and Aiden Grant are in CHSCA All-State Honors for their performances on the football team. Founded in 1951, the Connecticut High School Coaches Association supports its members and their coaches by offering ongoing education opportunities. Congratulations to Joe and Aiden. And last month, the American Legion Oratorical Contest was held, and several students, including my colleague Venice Montanero, represented foreign. What's more, Venice won the contest and advanced to the next round this month, where she placed second last week at districts. 
Awesome Job Venice. On January 27th, Warren also recognized International Holocaust Remembrance Day by meeting with Holocaust survivors and their family members. We give a, a special thanks to Andy Sar Sarkani, Susan Unrad, and Hedwich Klepper for sharing their stories and bringing to light such an important time in our history. For their final assignment of the semester, Intro to Photography students had the choice to create images with reflections, dramatic lighting, night photography, dyna <laughs> dynamic landscapes, or self-portraits. To capture successful images, students needed to apply compositional and technical skills learned throughout the course. Also, in Mrs. Plute's ceramics and pottery class, students created vessels inspired by each of their personal heritages. Their designs had to be inspired by their ancestry's traditional pot shape and color treatment. They all came out great. Earlier this month, the health and PE departments teamed up to create um, an active learning task for students to complete. The maze, it's called, allows students to work on their decision-making skills and their verbal and nonverbal communication skills while also applying their short-term memory skills to solve a variety of mazes. This is a fun and engaging activity for all. In sports, the foreign wrestling team completed their regular season last Wednesday night with a victory over SCC rival Amity. They finished the regular season with a 28-9 record and were champions of the SCC division. They are headed to the postseason with an eye on the Class M state championship. Lastly, the Milford boys swimming and diving team finished their season strong with two additional wins in the past two weeks. Their first win was a rematch against West Haven on February 3rd, and the team also took home a win on February 7th against Sheehan at their senior night. The team celebrated eight seniors, including myself, and while we fell short to Notre Dame West Haven at our last meet, we're now preparing for SEC trials on February 27th. Thank you again for your time, and Venice and I look forward to speaking with you again next month. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Jonathan Locke? You guys want to go. Thank you and good, e good evening, board members. It is a pleasure to be with you once again. I will begin tonight with some law amazing news. Students from 41 states, as well as Washington, D.C., will be representing their schools, communities, and, y and the YMCA during an advocacy and civic engagement program culminating with time in Washington, D.C. from February 12th to 15th, 2023. And that being said, there are only two representatives chosen from each state, and both from Connecticut are from Jonathan Law High School. Hayden Shepman and Katie Service will serve as representatives for the state of Connecticut. While in D.C., they will spend time meeting with Congress members as well as other youth advocates from other states. They will be able to speak out about the issues in their local communities and create plans to resolve them. The trip also includes a sightseeing tour, discussions with the 118th Congress, Hillstoppers panel, time with state representatives, and time on the Hill. Safe Promise Club advisor Ms. Healy and National Youth Advisory Board member Aileen Burns um, traveled to Atlanta, Georgia to participate in the Sandy Hook Promise Winter Institute where they spoke about preventing violence in schools, discrimination, school climate, mental health awareness, and many other topics. They presented about the Save Promise Club activities at law and planned for the summit in April, which they will host for the Save Promise Clubs nationwide. The JLHS Ski Club has recently visited Butterbutt and Killington for their day trips. The National Honor Society inducted 24 new members at their ceremony last week. Tomorrow, during an extended advisory, law will be hosting our annual elective fair. In academics, Law English teachers have been busy revising the curriculum documents for English 1, 2, and 3 to better represent our diverse student body. This content will be taught using a freshly curated set of books which were recently ordered by the district coordinator. Our broadcast journalism students will soon air their documentaries through, Fox, for, through the Fox 61 student news program. One of these documentaries will focus on our art department's involvement with gun safety organization Wings for Peace. The TLC has checked out over 1,000 books so far this year, with recent emphasis being on, put on books covering social justice and other high interest topics. Our media specialist has been working with the Black Student Union as well as the News Department in order to highlight black history literature. In preparation for our new state-funded e-books and audiobooks, we have begun a promotional campaign to advertise the resources. The TLC has also started some new fun activities, including a stick together mosaic art project and a button maker. The chessboard has been very popular and gets checked out many times a day. Our advanced vocal ensemble has been accepted as a feature ensemble at the 2023 CMEA conference, similar to a sports team making it to states. 
This is the first time that a school from Milford has been selected for this honor. Law Choir was represented by 24 students in the CMEA Re August Region Festival in January. Nine students made it into this year's CMEA All-State Festival. Our band also saw two students naked into All-State. They also performed at the Regional Honors Festival. And in law sports action, thank you and farewell to our athletic director, VJ Cerullo, who recently accepted a position at Staples High School. Our boys basketball team currently has a 14-3 record and is looking forward to finishing their regular season and competing in both the SEC and CIAC tournaments. Girls basketball just honored their four seniors and their families at senior night this past Friday. Our boys ice hockey team continues to compete in an effort to qualify for the CIAC tournament, coming back from a three goal deficit to Ty Wilton last week. Our boys and girls indoor track teams recently competed in the both SCC and CIAC championship meets. Congratulations to our boys relay team of Gabe Garnett, Shane Pritchard, Jack Brethauer, and Liam Fedigan for breaking a school record this past Saturday. Our wrestling team is looking forward to hosting the CIAC Class M Championship Meet this Friday and Saturday at Johnson Law. Our gymnastics team is also having another great season, finishing second at SCC Championships last week. Natalie Morell broke the school and SCC record on the beam at the Championship Meet, scoring a 9.6. Our boys swimming and diving and girls ice hockey student athletes are having excellent seasons, participating in their respective co-ops, and are looking forward to their upcoming postseason action and our update from school counseling and college and career. Last week was National School Counseling Week and we would like to say a quick thank you to all the school counselors in the district for their hard work and dedication to our, all of our students. The school counseling department will be hosting their annual sophomore symposium on Thursday, February 23rd at 6.30 in the auditorium. This event is for 10th grade students and families. The purpose of the symposium is to promote early college awareness, planning, and preparation. The panel of speakers consists of admissions professionals from Fairfield University, Southern CT State University, Marist College, and Bryant University. Last week, our counselors, our counselors visited junior English classrooms to discuss post high school planning. The counselors reviewed important steps for career exploration and seeking support for any pathway that students wish to pursue. This week, the department will be hosting military branch visits for the second time this year. Students and their families are invited to attend 30-minute info sessions to learn more about each branch. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you all, and we look forward to the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Feel free to head out, students. We appreciate your coming in, but we know you have things to do. So, Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We'll see you next Thank you. month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody here tonight that would like to make public comment to the board? Seeing none, we'll move on on the agenda. Chair's report. Um, board members, I just want to thank um, Ms. Doyle and Mr. Pelicetti for taking the time to attend the um, Cave Legislative Breakfast last week. Um, the bud we're in the middle of the budget cycle. We have the public hearing for the Board of Finance uh, for the community on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, the 15th. It's at 7 p.m. It's via Zoom. Uh, and then Dr. Kutaya, administration, and myself will be presenting the budget to the Board of Finance on March 1st, again via Zoom, that's at 5.30. Um, I know you have the links if anybody's interested in watching and the links have been sent out. So um, that's all I have for my Chair's report tonight. Dr. Kutaya, Superintendent's Thank you, Ms. Report. Lennon. Thank you, members of the Board. Uh, our first order of business under the Superintendent's Report is something that I'm really excited about um, to introduce to you a couple of new administrators that we've been able to onboard uh, just recently. and. Please forgive me, our introductions this evening will be a little longer because there's just so much that these new administrators bring to the table that I, do, I couldn't leave anything out. So I have to share all of it, of course. Um, so I'm happy to uh, introduce to you Therese McGuire. Therese, if you want to just stand and give a big wave. <laughs> Therese is uh, the newly named Supervisor of Early Childhood Education. Um, so, Therese has had an extensive professional career in educational practice for the youngest of students, particularly in the preschool environment. Until her appointment here in Milford, she served as a director of early childhood in the Bridgeport Public School System. Ms. McGuire received her Bachelor of Science degree in Sociology from Southern Connecticut, followed by a Master's of Arts from Sacred Heart University, and she continued her education at Sacred Heart, receiving her six-year certification at, um, as a Connecticut Literacy Program Specialist 
and a six-year certification in education administration in 2007. And maybe even recently have, uh, have had somebody in the room for an, um, an instructor for the 093 class. So I got to know Ms. McGuire through that program. Ms. McGuire served in a variety of increasingly um, responsible educational roles over her last 24 years, including classroom teacher, assistant principal, and principal prior to serving as an early childhood director in Bridgeport. As the director of early childhood, Ms. McGuire provided extensive leadership in weaving technology into, into the program in Bridgeport. Collaborating with district leadership, she helped develop analysis platforms for state student data, plan professional development, and create district level plans for high quality instruction. In addition, she implemented the use of student aligned software, including Footsteps to Brilliance, Clever University Kids, and Osmo, as well as the integration of several preschool screening apps, such as Sparkler. As a member of the School Readiness Council, she served as a communication liaison between the community and staff members for, student, for schools identified as SRC sites. She has also worked to embed a variety of social and emotional learning tools used at the preschool level. Ms. McGuire developed strong relationships and support in the department's quest for the completion of the National Association for the Education of the Young Child, accreditation, and collaborated with the State of Connecticut's Office of Early Childhood Education to ensure best practices were followed throughout the district. So I hope you can hear from this evening's introduction how many strong foundational <coughs> skills and experiences she brings to Milford in so many areas that we really needed some uh, strong leadership in. So already hit the ground running, has been all over the elementary schools, every preschool classroom, every kindergarten, bumping into first and second grade too, <coughs> connecting with our team upstairs in the teaching and learning department really has already made a huge splash in uh, our early childhood endeavor with intentional play and executive function. So welcome, Ms. McGuire. Welcome. You can clap. <laughs> uh, our most recently hired administrator is here in the room with us. Happy to share that Marissa Acampora is the instructional supervisor for equity and engagement. Marissa? So again, so much that Marissa brings to the table. Um, <clears throat> she did do uh, much of her professional work in West Haven, but let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, Ms. Kampora has served in a variety of increasingly responsible educational roles over her past 14 years. Originally starting her career as a speech language pathologist, Marissa spent her first six years in the capacity both in New Haven and Orange Public Schools. In 2014, Marissa joined the West Haven Public School System as a speech and language pathologist, but this time with additional responsibilities as an administrative designee in the district's central office. She has a background in communication disorders and sciences from Southern Connecticut University, earning her degree there. She continued her education at Southern and earned a Master of Science in Speech and Language Pathology, and spending several years as a professional educator Marissa earned her 092 from Sacred Heart University. <clears throat> With her continued interest and passion in leadership opportunities and having earned her administrative certification, Marissa joined the superintendent's cabinet in 2020 as the central office district liaison just as COVID-19 hit. So you can imagine all the great responsibilities Marissa was uh, assigned to. In July of 21, though, Marissa uh, once again promote, was promoted and was named the Central Office Director of Programs and Engagement in the West Haven Public Schools. In that new role, she served again as a member of the Superintendent's Cabinet, providing district-wide direction and oversight for all programs developed to remediate learning loss and accelerate academic grain, gains in the wake of COVID. Additionally, she created and led the district outreach team developed to assist in reconnecting students and families in the areas of access and engagement. Marissa's work, conducted in collaboration with colleagues, has been recognized by professional organizations across the state. One such program, just to highlight, focused on re-engaging multilingual learners through focused summer instruction, and it was featured in a Connecticut Association of Public School Superintendents publication last summer. Additionally, a health equity campaign that was created in tandem with the communications director for the district was awarded the Bonnie B. Carney Award of Excellence for Educational Communication from the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education. 
A little known fact, Marissa was also born and raised in Milford. Mm. And she's thrilled to be back. And she has already, um, in such a short period of time, I think you've been here less than a month, right, Marissa? Yeah. Um, or is it exactly a month? Uh, this week, right? This week. So in four weeks, Marissa's already out in all of our schools, already connecting with students and staff and administrators, um, is, has already established such an environment of uh, engagement herself and relationship building, um, already making an impact and learning so much about our community. We hope to bring to you, um, to this board, an update um, on our work in equity and engagement later in May or June. So welcome, Marissa. So like the students, I'll say, I know you guys had a long day. If you'd like to go ahead and go home and take care of homework, thank you for joining us this evening. And at this time, I'm happy to turn things over to Dr. Fedigan for our math um, instructional highlights. Thank you, Dr. Pataya. Good evening, members of the board. Um, tonight, we're very enthusiastic to share with the board an update on our work in mathematics. And as the board, you may recall, we have a seven-year curriculum revision cycle. Something that we're really proud of with, with that cycle is it really provides coherence in our school system. Beyond in the development of curriculum aligned to standards, it provides us an opportunity throughout that seven year cycle to think about how we're aligning curriculum that we design in district. Remember, we're not a district that buys wholesale programs. Um, we thoughtfully plan and write, and write curriculum that's homegrown right here. Um, but in addition, how we align that curriculum to our instructional practices how we align the curriculum to best practices and assessment, and then also thinking about how we ensure really high quality um, professional learning for our staff throughout all parts of that cycle. So tonight we'll have the opportunity to share with you where we are with regard to the curriculum cycle in all parts of our um, mathematics programming and instruction grades pre-K through grade 12. So um, tonight I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Swanson, our Instructional <coughs> Supervisor for Mathematics 612, and Dr. Tom Nobley, Instructional Supervisor for Elementary Mathematics. They'll share with you an update again, really trying to bring to life where we are in the curriculum revision cycle in each of the grades, preschool through grade 12. We also have two staff members with us tonight, so I want to thank Joanne Thompson and Jamie Ekstrand from Orange Avenue School who will share um, from, with us what the experience is like as an elementary educator in this part of our work. We also shared with the board, and if you did your homework, you would have seen um, an overview for mathematics instruction at the elementary level because we realize it's very important to partner with families as we make shifts in mathematics curriculum and instruction. And we also shared with the board a few podcasts which would provide, I think, a bird's eye view into middle school staff and student experience with some of the shifts that we've recently made. So at this point, I'll turn it over to both Mrs. Swanson and Dr. Nobley, and then at the end, we'll of course be happy to take any questions that the board has. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Fagan. Good evening. So just a very um, quick kind of overview of our agenda for tonight. So Dr. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about where we are with the curriculum cycle, as Dr. Fetty alluded to, in each of um, our areas of mathematics, elementary, middle, and high school. Um, we'll certainly talk about the work we're doing um, in HQI, particularly in mathematics. And we are lucky to have some teachers here that will um, help us out a little bit to share out their experience um, with some of our new curriculum and the great things that they're doing. So we figured we'd just start out um, by, by kind of engaging the board uh, in, a, in a bit of a, a math problem. Um, this might be actually super um, poignant, as you may have um, experienced this last night, maybe, and you were sharing your, your, your snacks for the big game. Um, so this this kind of gives an example, um, and we'll give everyone a minute, a minute to kind of read it and think about it, but, but don't worry, we, we won't be spending uh, too much time uh, tonight going through it. Um, but it provides kind of a very concrete example of something that this would be um, is in our fourth grade math curriculum in, in one of our units on fractions. So this is, uh, um, again, a very concrete example of what actually gets in front of kids. And we'll talk about all the work that goes um, in before that um, in designing the curriculum, again, based on uh, the standards and, and our division of a learner and, of course, our model for high quality instruction. Um, so, 
I'll give you just about 30 seconds to think about how you might go about solving that, what you might think. Um, there's a couple of questions on the next slide that um, is also on your handout that are kind of what we would ask kids to think about, reason about, um, and discuss in, in this particular problem. Also want to point out again that the, and um, this type of a, a thinking experience, as we as we call them, sits in a in a progression. So as I mentioned, this is um, a fourth grade example, but if you, we can think back to kindergarten and first grade. So those students actually start to think about partitioning to equal shares with shapes um, early on, which again leads into obviously thinking more formally about um, fractions beginning in third grade and into fourth. And then continuing on from that, kid, as kids move into middle and high school, um, they extend um, their thinking to um, the scope of rational numbers, uh, which includes fractions and all those other um, uh, wonderful numbers that they'll be thinking about. So we try to think vertically about how these things sit and think about how a kid would, would um, experience year to year and build on their prior knowledge as they're thinking about what that new learning is for the standards in that grade. Um, and the other um, piece too is this also connects to some of the other things we're working on in district. So we just talked about um, uh, some of our, our new early childhood director and some of that work. So even in intentional play, kids are thinking about executive functioning. They're thinking about how do I make a play plan? Um, what am I? How am I, What am I going to? Um, how am I going to interact with my peers during that time? They have time to reflect on how did that go? What might I do differently? And of course, that's all preparing them to, to take on problems like this, to uh, build their stamina for thinking um, and interacting with, with tougher problems. Um, and then again, also um, vertically across two, or, or sorry, horizontally across two, um, in science, for example, two are the other area that we, of course, supervise. Again, kids have, uh, if we look at the science and engineering practices, kids have the opportunity to um, reason computationally, to model, again, all connected to um, things they would do in mathematics as well. So they have opportunities to apply these things um, throughout the day. How's everybody feeling about that problem? <laughs> we didn't run into any math folks in the room, did we? Possibly, maybe. <laughs> All right, well, I'm Lisa Swanson. I'm honored and it is my um, absolute pleasure to be with you tonight to share some of the amazing work that we're doing here in the district in the mathematics uh, curriculum across pre-K pre all the way up to 12th grade. This is a graph, you're, uh, an image you're familiar with. This represents that seven-year cycle that Dr. Fedigan me mentioned. And today we're gonna take you up, as Dr. Katalia likes to say, up to the balcony to have kind of that overview look of the work that's going on, thanks to your support. Really, you guys are in this year's budget season, but honestly, we're gonna talk about things that really started in last year's budget season, around those conversations and how we're going to really take this theoretical graph and we're gonna show you what that really looks like in our work throughout the district. So here we've replaced what is the cycles with the actual work that is occurring in the district currently. So right now, we're in a year one program review where we're taking a look at our first three courses in high school, Algebra, Algebra two, and Geometry. And then what happened a year ago was that middle school went through that program review and we're currently in a writing cycle with them where we're taking a look at our middle school programs and then a couple years ago that work started and now currently in, in year three is our kindergarten and first and second grade. And then more than a couple of years ago, all through a pandemic, we started working on our third, fourth and fifth grade. So we're seeing that. And then we also have curriculum that is in place in, those are all our high school courses right now that are in systemic implementation. We're kind of chunking that high school work so that it is manageable and that it is authentic to the work that we need to do. So that kind of takes what you look at theoretically and brings it into where we are right now. And everybody, like, so when you see that year four or five group, they've actually already come through years one, two, and three. So let's take a look at what year one really looks like. What is that program review? 
And this slide is a little overwhelming when I look at it, but it brings me back to the summer, where I had a small group of teachers who agreed to come in over the summer and take a look at what are we doing in high school mathematics. So this is our algebra, geometry, and algebra two team. How is our current curriculum working for us? What are the things we'd like to see improved? What does research say about what current best practices are in teaching mathematics? So a big part of this initial phase is really looking at our current understanding of our current curriculum and also taking that time to really introduce teachers to current research around mathematics instruction. So it's not, it looks like it's just about programs because there's a bunch of them listed there, but the reality is, is we don't start looking at any of those until we realign ourselves to our vision, take a look at some authentic research around what's going on and, and best practices in high school mathematics, do some of that learning together so that we can all be aligned before we even consider any options that would be on the table for us to enhance our curriculum. So we're really taking it pretty slow during this process. We really are in a research phase. What, what, is, what does the research tell us? What should we be doing? What is out there and available? And does that align with our current curriculum? First of all, because we do have a curriculum, we have that in place, and we're looking, are there any additional resources out there that can improve what we're currently doing? Um, I'm trying to figure out if I forgot anything. So I would say that, so what you're seeing there on the left are some of the options available out there on the market. When I started 25 years ago, this looked more like us sitting in a room and a, and a book company guy coming in and doing some kind of a half hour pitch and then another book company guy came in and did another half hour pitch and you kind of went through this sales pitch of which ones are the best. The process is so very different now that really we're starting with our vision, looking at each QI and saying, okay, how does that impact our instruction? What do we want to see? and then authentically taking a look at what is actually out there and available now. So after we finish that cycle, we move into then more of a let's actually try some things out. And in that first year, we dabble a little bit. So some, some of those teachers on that committee are going to take some of those lessons, kind of do a lesson study. What is this lesson asking? How can I use this lesson? Does it work? But it's really an exploration. We have not inserted all the professional learning yet. These are really the teachers who are willing to kind of step out of their comfort zone, potentially try out a different lesson that they've never tried before. So they finish that up in that first cycle and we narrow down the process. So this is where middle school is. So they started this process a year ago, in pro or actually two years ago in program review. We actually took two years to do a program review with them. And now here we are looking at two resources that last year came, rose to the top as potential possibilities to support our curriculum. We still have what you see there in the middle is a quick glimpse of a curriculum map. So we have one curriculum still that we're utilizing and we're trying out different resources to see is, does illustrative math, does that align to HQI? Does that align to our vision? Is it supportive of student learning? Can our, is, is it accessible for our, all our students? We're looking for what research calls like um, low floor, high ceiling tests so that no matter where my background is, I can access that and be given the support to actually move through the continuum of learning to that abstract math in middle school. So this is a representation of kind of what that looks like right now. We have our curriculum map that's been reworked. We looked at the standards through our process, and now we're looking at which one of these might better suit our needs, or is it a combination of both of these that would be best to suit our needs and help us elevate our curriculum to the next level. But we're really still exploring, trying out, doing analysis, but we have a little bit more professional learning time built in here now. We've had some more discussions. We went from a couple people trying to a lot more people trying. Actually, everybody did, agreed that they would take on one of these to try, and we are flipping and making sure everybody's getting absolute exposure so that whatever, if we make a single decision, multiple decisions, that we've done that with an authentic, real experience and not just looked and got sold kind of on look, oh, it looks glitzy and glamoury, like, oh, that looks great. And then you go and try it out in the classroom and what they say is a lesson actually takes four days to do. And, that, and what they say is gonna be engaging kids absolutely cannot stand. You know, we have to make sure that our students are really, that this is fitting our needs that we want to achieve high quality instruction and ultimately student performance. <coughs> and Tom's gonna to talk about the next phase. 
you. So um, after kind of that um, writing phase where our curriculum maps are written, um, we move into um, what we call initial implementation. And right now our K-2 uh, work is, is in that phase. So we, what happens here is we, again, as Ms. alluded to write a curriculum map, but then we write what's called an implementation guide, which you see a screenshot of there. And again, that basically worked as uh, we already spoke about, we don't just, a resource to us is not, is not a curriculum. So we need to have a document that talks about what students need to know and be able to do. And the implement, whereas the curriculum map is kind of a, a balcony overview, the implementation guide gives teachers support in implementing the curriculum each day um, or week, you know, kind of in a, in a much more granular way to support the actual implementation um, in terms of their instructional practice, assessment practices, um, and where they and then where they are in terms of supporting student learning. So that's where we are in K two. Obviously, what comes along with that is a lot of professional um, learning. So obviously we have instructional coaches that support that implementation each day um, in classrooms with teachers. Um, we will run um, unit like unpacking sessions with teachers where we can go through units, um, get acquainted with the material, anticipate what students might need. Um, so we, we definitely do those as well. Um, as a couple examples, we have a slide later in the presentation that will get some more detail on the professional learning that surrounds us, but just to give you a little bit of what happens when we're doing the initial um, implementation. Um, we also um, are constantly taking feedback. Um, so we're taking feedback from um, teachers, uh, coaches, principals, and even students um, in terms of how they're experiencing the curriculum. And we use that to make, modify, and adjust throughout the seven year cycle. So I just want to um, make the point that it's not like we write through a curriculum and then we don't do anything with it for seven years. We're constantly making adjustments throughout that time based on feedback that we're getting from, um, again, our teachers, our coaches, our principals um, throughout the process. And then we're also looking at this um, in this phase at um, how are we aligning um, our assessment practices to mirror what is happening with our curriculum. And so we're starting to um, look and pilot some of that. And again, we've talked many times as board about um, assessment. Um, and again, looking at how can we really support students in the moment day to day beyond just um, like the SBA that they'll get this spring and we'll get the results four months later, which is much too late to really do anything to impact learning. Okay, so from there, we move into what we call uh, systemic implementation. This is currently where our 3 5 curriculum is. Um, so, again, a couple of key points <laughs> in that. Obviously, continued professional learning in all the ways that I, I had mentioned before. Um, so, we want to continue that to support teachers throughout that process um, and really never goes away throughout the whole cycle. Um, revised implementation guide. So, we took feedback that we got from uh, teachers and coaches last year. On, our initial implementation of 3.5 when we worked over the spring and summer to make some scope and sequence changes, to make some modifications in certain places where we needed to tweak a lesson here or there, um, and then roll out the new uh, kind of updated piece this year. So that's constantly happening. Um, and then we're looking to finalize that assessment piece, and one key point there is, you know, we really think of assessment as a way of communicating where a student is and where they need to go next in their learning. So part of that is communicating to parents about what their child um, is experiencing every day in that. So one of the things that we've done the, at the elementary level, we've developed uh, parent overviews for each of our units. Again, as Dr. Fedigan mentioned, we have um, included one in your packet for your review. And these are meant to give parents, again, an, uh, an opportunity to get a sense of what their child is learning in each unit, how they can support them, um, and things like that. So those are um, available on our, our website. Also, teachers distribute them um, in their communication with parents as well. Um, and then again, we continue to monitor and adjust, and we'll continue to make changes throughout that seven-year cycle with that. Okay, so again, this just emphasizes, um, again, what we're trying to do with the curriculum and with assessment. So I, again, I hope you, you've heard today, but I want to point it out um, just to be explicit about it. You know, we are still teaching math facts and all of the things that we learned in math. So I want to be 
be clear about that. We expect kids to know what nine times nine is and all that. But what we are, but, but that's not the, the kind of the end of it now. We, we're teaching that and we're expecting kids um, to go deeper. So do they have an understanding of what nine times nine means, for example? Can they relate it to the operation of division? Um, can they apply that to um, problems that um, they may experience in the real world, such as the one that we showed you at the beginning of this presentation? So we look at kind of those three pieces, back fluency, conceptual understanding, and application, and that is what we're focusing on both in our curriculum and our assessment practices to really get students um, to deep mathematical learn. So we just wanted to um, be clear about that and kind of show that lens as we um, move forward so that we don't end up um, with situations like this, which um, <laughs> is just funny. Um, but again, we're trying to, we're trying to move away from <laughs> this type of assessment and more into kind of really getting into a deep understanding and supporting the students to know. And then we're both going to kind of just talk through this one, but this again has more detail about some of the professional learning experiences that are offered or that are given to teachers um, throughout um, the curriculum revision cycle. So we've talked about unit rollout, packing sessions um, that happen to help students, uh, to, help, to help teachers get acclimated to the new curriculum and resources and, 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 and prepare and plan before teaching them. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, um, we have coaching support, K to eight, um, you know, or instructional, our, our, uh, Ms. Monson and I will support teachers um, in the process as well, going into classrooms, um, supporting them in curriculum implementation, debriefing with them, and supporting their practices. Um, lab sites. As we move further up the, into the cycle and people get more comfortable, then we also want them learning from each other. So we might analyze a lesson, look at that lesson, see what tweaks we would do differently. So. If I've got an illustrative math lesson in front of me and it says, you know, it's a whole group discussion, we might say, we don't want them to discuss that as a whole group. We might, well, let's try elbow partners for that. And then we'll go into each other's classrooms and take a look at how that lesson go. We're all teaching that lesson. What happened when we made tweaks? How did that go differently than when I taught it if I didn't tweak it? Things like that so that we can learn from each other along with this process. So it's not just about sitting theoretically talking about it, but also there are multiple teachers teaching algebra. Everybody's got a different style and everybody has different components of HQI that they pull in on a daily basis. So learning about all of that together as we move up through the process. And even like right now, when we're still in the exploration phase, we're doing a lot of instruction around high quality math practices. We have a great text that's recently come out called Building Thinking Classrooms. That's what you heard if you listen to that podcast. Teachers um, doing simple tweaks like visually random grouping students, which we think like, why is that such a big deal? Well, it turns out it actually has a lot of SEL components to it. It has a lot of um, classroom culture. So that if we want a culture where kids are taking risks, and working with others than having this visible random grouping. The teachers are amazed at trying this one little thing, which has to be, has nuances to it, because you know, you give them cards and then all of a sudden they're switching cards, they're kids. They want to be with their friends, they don't want to be with that other kid, but now you do it every day and all of a sudden that class becomes its own little community. So little things like that, like you heard on that podcast that we're working on as a math department as we continue to explore different resources to best support the content as well. And I think we have the best part now. Yeah, I was just about to say, this is my, my favorite part of, of the presentation. I think we both, in planning this with, with Dr. Bredigan and Dr. Pekai, we just kind of all agreed. Um, again, we can tell you all about the professional learning that happens and, and um, the instructional practice for a model of HQI. We can tell you all about our curriculum revision cycle, but why not bring in um, uh, some of our teachers, and, and the two here tonight are, are exceptional practitioners that have really um, run with the new curriculum and with the model for HQI. Um, and um, we're gracious enough to accept this invitation to be here to talk a little bit about their experience. So again, it's my pleasure to, to introduce uh, Joanne Thompson, who teaches grade one at Orange Avenue School, and Jamie Ekstrand, who teaches grade five at Orange Avenue School, again, to just give a little bit about um, their experience and what the great work that they're doing with our students each and every day. Good evening. Uh, 
Um, we are excited to be here. A little nervous because it's an idea to be here. Um, so scary. They're really <laughs> um, Like um, as, uh, Dr. Nobley said, I'm Joanne Thompson. I teach first grade at Orange Ave. And I'm Jamie Asher. I'm fifth grade. Um, this is actually my 17th year as, a, as an educator, but my first year in Milford. So I'm seeing everything for the first time six months in. Um, <laughs> And um, I can attest to all the professional learning because I think I've been a part of every aspect of that professional learning just six months in because that's how fantastic our support system is and our administrators. Um, when I interviewed with Dr. Fedigan in the summer, she pulled up the HQI model and asked me, well, what stands out to you? You know, probably the second time I've seen it in my life. And the one thing that I really pulled out was that authentic task piece because when I learned how to be a teacher 20 something years ago, um, it was all about modeling the algorithm and then we practice it together and then the students do it a million times and then we get to the problem solving real life application and what I'm seeing diving into the curriculum here with the HQI model is it's almost flipped. Well, we're starting with the real life application authentic task putting students together and saying, okay, using your knowledge of mathematics, your number sense, your basic operations that you know already, how, what strategies can you come with? What is your thinking on how you would go about solving this? Um, so it's been amazing to see what these students can do, and I am super impressed with their level of ability, their computation, their just what they come up with as far as patterns in their number sets. And, all right, yeah, so I have noticed a big shift also. I've been here for 22 years. Um, but um, over the summer, I attended the HQI session, which I really enjoyed. And my big takeaway from that from Dr. Kataya and the other admin was to just go back to your room and try something. So I was like, well, that sounds like I could do that. <laughs> so, um, so I went back and I had a goal, you know, all teachers choose goals for the year. And so my goal for the year was to change my, my uh, shift my mind, shift my mindset, um, and to have students use each other as resources rather than be so dependent on the teacher like you had referred to back um, <coughs> when we started off. Um, and so, you know, I was a little unsure of how this was going to go. And um, once I started the math curriculum, um, it was pretty clear very early on that um, how nicely it led into the HQI model that I had learned <coughs> this summer. And so I worked really closely with the coaches. Um, I did work with Dr. Nobley too on my questioning, my feedback to get those students to where I, you know, that more of that HQI model. Um, and it didn't take long for them to start becoming agents of their own learning and it was a lot of work. Um, you know, together we kind of learned what feedback to give for them to know. So, for example, um, if they were stuck on, they most, you know, we do work a lot in partnerships, um, sometimes random, sometimes chosen by me. Um, and um, I lost track of what I was going to say. Um, and so, through my questioning and feedback to them, they realized, like, oh, I'm stuck or we're stuck. You know, let's go over to this group and let's talk to them. And so, um, you know, now it's just, it's a big, it's a different feel. So I feel like in the past, the teachers or teachers had this idea, like the kids were sitting and working quiet. And if an admin went by, they were thrilled that the kids were <laughs> you know, doing their stuff. And now it's, it's more of like, it's loud, it's messy, it's kids working together. Um, and they have really, really done amazing. Um, and I don't know if you were gonna say this, but I'm gonna say it quick and then you could add on to it. But a lot of the, um, each unit starts with a story and it is, it's real authentic. It's, um, it's engaging for the kids. And so they, ha they, they buy into it because there's a story behind it and there's um, something of interest. It's very engaging for them. And um, so I feel like the whole curriculum has just lent, lent itself very nicely to the HQI model. And our um, an integral part are the coaches, I feel, mm -hmm. and Dr. Nobley has been in my classroom to model, and we're working closely together 
live, real time, working with the kids, bouncing around, and our big focus on giving that um, that feedback, in which we're never we're never giving answers to the students, mm -hmm. but we're um, effectively questioning them to lead them to understanding, and then the self-regulatory part is okay, you don't have to ask the teacher, you can use each other as resources, which is a real life skill um, mm -hmm. to use each other and seek help from different students and strategies and understanding. And a, and a really cool part of the curriculum too is our ga gallery walks where the students present their strategy for solving a problem and then they go around and analyze each other's and provide feedback, specific feedback on how theirs is similar or different from theirs. Um, and then they gain more knowledge from each other. So that's very, very cool to see. Thank, Thank you, ladies. So much. Nice work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So that's the end of our formal presentation. I'm sure there might be some questions or some information you guys might want to ask us. Or, you know. Certainly. Thank you. You're welcome. Questions from board members or comments? Ms. Wolf Boynton. Um, actually, uh, Ms. Thompson, my question's to you. Um, you talked about how the units, they started with a story. Yeah. That Could you just explain what you mean by that? Um, sure. So we just finished our Farms and Fences <laughs> um, unit. And so there's a story about farmers. They you know, grow different things, and they're measuring their um, they're, they need a fence for their farm to put around their farm. And so th that's how the story starts. And then the kids have to um, have to come up with different measurements of the, of the per perimeter of the, of the farm. And so they're using um, the cuisineer rods as measurement. And, and ultimately, um, what we're seeing is of course, I can't remember the numbers right now, but certain rods, um, one of them was like 10, we're using centimeters, uh, was 10, and for them to realize like, oh, you could use two orange because the orange are five, so two orange is equal to one yellow, so that, you know, five plus five is 10, or there's a red one that's two centimeters, so how many red would equal the, um, the yellow or the 10? Um, we did a school bus one, which was a lot of fun in the beginning of the year, and um, how many passengers are on top and on the bottom. And so as they go by, they may see, um, they know already there's 10 seats on the top and the bottom, and they may see eight passengers on the top, and how many seats are left. So that's how we tied in a lot of the um, math facts. You know, I see eight, I know two more to get to 10. Um, and they did that in the top and the bottom, so within 20. Uh, and they love that. <laughs> Starting with a story, thanks Mrs. Thompson, really I think helps to create a hook for the students. It creates some context around which they'll be exploring some math ideas. Very different than probably how many of us around the table learn math where there, I think you were saying this before, Jamie, there's you know a model problem, there's eight more just like it, and then at the end there's the quiz or the test. So the story really does set context within a real world situation that is a little bit more right engaging to enter into wondering about mathematics. And you can imagine, especially at the elementary level, that that provides an opportunity for students to also to develop not only reasoning, but language skills um, as they explore solving, solving a story together. And, and I would just quickly add to that too, um, it, it provides a, an, an entry point for everyone. So if student, you know, if it was uh, just numbers, Know that a student might not be able to enter that problem, but by thinking about, oh, okay, there's eight, there's eight people in these seats, there's four people, what does that look like on the bus, right? A student who may not have been able to enter it at such an abstract level is able to model that, think about what that looks like in reasoning. Okay? So um, it provides a, 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 a was talking about low floor and high ceiling, but I think it provides an entry point for our learners as well as they move to the more you know, kind of formal math. And the kids never ask, when am I going to use this in real life? <laughs> Start to know. It's multiplying fractions, dividing fractions. Now they know real life applications of it. Other questions? Ms. Wolf, uh, Ms. Doyle. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to your example of the, the subs. We had earlier in the year talked about the authentic tax and the smart balance assessment and having students be able to do this. Um, is that an example of an authentic task that they would have on an exam? Similar, 
similar in one of these smarter balancing assessments. So in that sort of thing, it would be this student, not each group was equal. They would have to write out a full answer. It wouldn't be a multiple choice answer. It would be a much more difficult yeah, assessment. There's a, there's a part of the smarter balance and map up performance task, and it's problems like that. Okay. And it yeah. would be they more, have it, yeah. they have to handwrite mm -hmm. it out, well, type it, type it yeah. out. <laughs> the answer. But yeah. you have full sentences, and it's not mm -hmm. like bullet points or. It's or not just like yeah. ABC. Yeah. They have to even, justify their answer, all, all the, all okay. the time. Not That's just like the cartoon that was displayed. No. <laughs> Fill in the blank for short and write multiple choice, yeah. true or false. Well, I mean, to me, that's a much harder task mm -hmm. than me answering and saying no. Like reading right. that and right. being able to identify and go through those processes, which I'm assuming through your gallery are different examples of that students would pull from of saying, I'm able to identify these sort of <laughs> answers of this is how they achieved it, this is how they achieved it. I need to be able to say, this is the answer. So could that reflect some decrease in test scores because students have to set, set out steps versus just identify a multiple choice test or things like that? You know, there's some conversations along the lines of where are test scores? And so there is a learning curve assessment within this process. The assessment itself is, it can be a challenge just to navigate that alone because they're on a computer screen and they're, um, there's some things they're sliding things they're moving things around like it's it's more dynamic mm -hmm. than like that multiple choice that we took but the reality is is that one problem is assessing them on multiple things so their their th thinking is what they need to bring to the table right they can't just be trained to add or subtract or multiply or divide they have to be they have to understand when how where why and even sometimes I actually don't need to do all that like this is really just like if I understand the concept I, some of them they if they just understood what it was asking and didn't like kind of attach all the equation work to it right away they'd actually get an answer mm -hmm. like we work on that even in the SAT the SAT is needy so each one of those questions is, is really trying to get them to under like they want to know if they know five different things in that one question so sometimes they want to attack it with a problem and it's really like you know what equivalence means. So just think about what things are equal there and you'll figure it out. But so it's teaching them to kind of stop, pause, think, and then attach the mathematics as opposed to what we were all taught, which was do the math, do the math, do the math, do the math. Oh, here's some problems that relate to that math, right? It's 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 really getting them to reverse that process. I think one of the teachers said it's kind of the opposite now. Okay. I I will say I read the smarter balance tests and questions, authentic tasks, and I was like, I don't have the, I can't think about <laughs> The stamina, right? right? Yeah, you have to be able to persevere. I that. was like, yeah. I, I, I don't, I'm yeah. not doing this. Um, <laughs> so you'll be submitting your answer to the question in the slides at the end of the meeting? I, I have an answer. I have an answer. <laughs> I am in like bar prep preparation, so I have <laughs> mental health like <laughs> exam questions. So then my next question is, is a lot of this conversation has focused on elementary schools versus middle schools and high schools. So how does this change? I mean, you discussed very briefly about SATs, but I'm assuming AP Calculus is not tossed through a story. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> um, but we are, t so um, we are looking for our, you know, one of our clearinghouses is, is, is it authentic, right? Authentic tasks in the HQI model. So if we're looking at a resource that's full of authentic tasks, and we're gonna t we're gonna dig deeper into it and say, are they good authentic tasks? And then our kids relate to them. Um, for ex one example that we're tr um, currently exploring at the high school is a program called Mathematic, and every day starts off with a real world problem. And the teachers are like, they never ever complain about word problems anymore. Mm -hmm. Like they're just every day, and it's really just. A situation, and they the protocol is kind of so. What do you think we're going to do today? It's not even like, okay, we're going to do slope and we're going to do this. And we're, it, it really starts off with a thinking process of take a look at this. What do you think we're going to be able to answer by the end of our our class today? So we are looking for the high school and middle school version of it starts off with the story, which is it starts off with a problem, and we're going to try to then you know decontextualize that problem, put some mathematics to it to then explore it further. Okay, great. This was helpful because even just discussing the programs that we are going to be going from the six to the three to the two and looking at it from a curriculum standpoint kind of attaches to our right to read program and where we are and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's very helpful to see kind of how it goes from there. Yeah. Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I agree with 
Ms. Doyle, it was a very helpful presentation. I wanted to piggyback a little bit off of what she talked about. A lot of times um, you, you hear the word assessment and you immediately think of SBAC, you think of SAT. I was wondering if you could give some sort of concrete examples of what assessment looks like at each level day to day um, and what you know parents could expect coming home um, to figure out where their kids are in the continuum of the curriculum. Yeah, I guess I'll start because um, we'll start with elementary. Sure, we'll start that way. <laughs> so um, we, so there's a lot. So we have a couple of I would call them more formal types of assessment. Obviously, that that kids get so, um, and then also kind of what you're talking about the day to day, kind of formative in the moment work that um, we want teachers to be responsive to students in the moment. So some of those more formal ones, um, so we give a number sense screener three times a year to our K-5 students, which again is aligned to the Common Core Standards and gives our teachers um, some information in terms of um, how a child is progressing through those standards and if we need to provide extra support that could give us um, an indication that that might be the case. Um, we also in grades three to five have built into our implementation guides, the um, IABs, which are the um, assessment blocks, which are kind of, um, they, come from, they come from the state, and they're kind of, um, instead of get having the um, SBA, which is on, all, I'd say, all the math standards in third grade, then right, you want to just fractions. So you can kind of zero in. Again, they're the exact same type of questions that kids would see on the actual SBA, and they have gives um, some information to teachers about um, where students are, what they might need to do in terms of adjusting their instruction. Um, before April or May when they, take, when they take the SBA. And then part of the work we've done this year as well is um, in all grades, uh, K to five, we've um, embedded um, end of unit, sometimes end of every two unit, kind of um, curricularly aligned tasks. So tasks that are similar to what kids have done um, in the unit, but these are done independently. And um, that gives the teacher information in terms of um, next steps they might have for a student as well um, that they can respond to. And then again, all the formative kind of day-to-day, -day. so there's math journals that kids respond to individually um, at the end of each kind of investigation that the teacher can use and certainly send home for information on what they might do the next day, uh, exit tickets, things like that as well. So that's kind of a um, quick summary of kind of all the things that, that we have in place um, to help inform us at the um, elementary level. So Dr. Nobley pretty much mentioned almost everything that we do, I would say, at the secondary level, too. It's not a numeracy screen anymore at the middle school level. Um, it's got a little, you know, it's rational numbers, and um, there's, again, that, that, that whole, you're right, assessment is not just SBA, right? There is an entire spectrum of, to the moment I ask a kid a question, I always say teaching is professional assessment more than anything else. Because the moment I ask the child a question and they interact with me, I've got to respond. I've got to process where they are and hopefully respond in a way that's supportive and appropriate <laughs> to keep them you know, in their learning trajectory. And, if I, and really we do that constantly as educators. Like that's like what I did all day long. So there's that, the assessment that's happening. Like you didn't write anything down. Really you were just in the moment to today they're gonna to walk into class and I might give them an entrance slip to see, like, do they, do they have what we talked about yesterday? Do they still have that so we can move forward today? To a typical, you know, a, a few day quiz that you'll see in the middle school, high school, to end of unit assessments. All of that is definitely in the picture. So from informal all the way up to formal. And of course, like, I think one of the bigger, like, we have the nice thing about Smarter Balance is they at least did give us those interim assessment blocks. So we try to strategically align those to the units to ensure that our students are getting, um, I always call, I talk, I call it assessment fluency. So we all drive cars, right? But uh, you get that rental and all of a sudden you're driving and you're like, how do you even turn on the radio, right? We all know how to turn on the radio. So we don't want kids to feel like that when they're taking the Smarter Balance assessment because like I said, there's it's a dynamic test, right? Things are moving. There's, rulers you can pull down and there's there's highlighters you can access so we want to make sure that when they take that assessment that's not the test that they're that they're hung up on that they have the brain power to then focus on the mathematics that they're doing so yeah the whole gambit is really part of all of our work right. as we move through this process that's really helpful uh, um, 
how, what of that information that you just talked about, it's not all going home, obviously. So yeah. what of that information at each level is going home? I know kids get report cards, but outside of that. So my level, they use power, it, power school information. I don't know that they're sending a lot of that assessment work home. I think it's more happening through the power school portal, through the Google Classroom portal, that they would be seeing that. So, and teachers make those local decisions as to when they, that something goes into the grade book. Um, ideally for me, you've got a really strong notebook that's going back and forth, that's communicating information. That's a goal that we're all working on to decide. Because when you look, when you drop, text like you know like we don't have just a math book anymore we use a lot of different resources and one of our goals is to really work on building the text right building that really cool authentic notebook that really is their their always resource you know so um that to me would be a parent communication tool along with like those um other pieces but for us a lot of that appears in in the middle school and high school classroom that comes through their their grade book i think okay yeah so at the elementary obviously they're not not using power school as much uh, for that reason so obviously we report our privacy reports but uh, the math journal um, like i said is something that would go home frequently if not every day for a uh, kind of again that home school connection to see what those students are doing any exit slips again when they finish some of these investigations um that they may take more than one day or a day you know, certainly they may bring some of that work home um as well uh, at the lower grades, sometimes if kids are working on a, a, like a game to build fluency, um, we'll send that game home with, you know, play with your, play with your mom and dad, teach them how to play, so there's a little communication that goes along with that there. Obviously, like the, the IAB stuff, which is like in a system and things like that, certainly we could communicate that as a parent um, asked, but there's not like a, a thing that we can send home with it. So um, similar to some of those things that Swanson mentioned, but. Um, I would say a lot of the, the math notebook and some again some of the work that they might do that would get sent home just like any other um, right. work. Right. Work that gets sent home. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Pellicetti? Um, I'd like to commend the teachers. To make that shift away from the methodologies that you know and that you've trusted into something new is very difficult because in the back of your mind you're thinking, if this doesn't work, how am I gonna get these kids where they need to be, right? And that's, that's a big leap of faith, and I commend you for doing it. It's very hard work. I was going to comment similarly to Mr. Pellicetti that um, I just wanted to thank you for being willing to question your own knowledge and practice and, and say, is there a better way to do this? Um, and I think it goes a long way uh, for the district of the culture to say it's okay to make the mistake. So if it doesn't work, you move on to something different, and you you know, what we're seeing as a board is that there's a lot of opportunity for teachers to engage with each other, to ask for help amongst your peers. You know, this isn't working, what do you think I could do? Um, and I just think that's such a valuable um, piece of, of, of the day for you to be able to do that. I think it's probably, I would think that it gives you a lot more concrete, um, usable information to be able to work with a peer and say, you know, help me work through this. So um, kudos to you, kudos to administration for developing that culture. Um, I think it's really vital. Ms. Ms. Doyle. <laughs> um, I'm going to go back to, we, you, you mentioned, Ms. Swanson, the sitting in the classroom and everyone just working silently on their papers. And I just think about going back to elementary school of I'd be one of the first kids done with the homework. Like, mm -hmm. I'd be done in class, not doing anything. So, and then I listened to the teachers speak about working with buddies and working together, and how do the city students navigate different abilities within the classroom? And you touched very briefly on the social-emotional learning aspect of working in teams and groups and things like that. That's an aspect that really wasn't part of our learning a lot <coughs> before. Right. And so now it's a different part of that. And so. Can you just explain a little bit about what that's like in the classroom and how do teachers navigate that and how do the students react to that sort of uh, learning from their peers and working with their peers and not relying so much on themselves? 
Yeah, that, that can, that varies, right? Depending on, you know, middle schoolers have a whole different psyche behind them around working with others. So we continue to work on that. I think it's uh, at this age level, they're training them to do that, but then they get to middle school and they start thinking about self a lot more, which is why we explore protocols and procedures to do in class. So if every day it's visibly random grouping or if every Friday is visibly random grouping day, it's no surprise and it's okay because I'm gonna get to know everybody around me. And we, we talked about that low floor, high ceiling. So not everybody's moving at the same pace like they did when we were in school, right? Not, so I might plan a lesson and I know I need everybody for my goal is like everybody's gotta get through the fourth problem, right? I know that that's, and anything beyond that might be extension processes. So that kids who are ready and can go can keep going. So uh, like when it's, Student-centered, it's not about everybody being in the same place at the same time. It's, it's much, the, the lesson is much more dynamic and I have to think about that in my planning as a teacher. I think um, when we were in school, like, you know, I, I just kind of sat politely and, you know, you know, doodled or something like that if I finished early. Whereas now, that's like precious learning time. Like, we want to keep you going because we know there's deeper, that you, there's deeper work that you can do or there's, you know, we, have, we were taught one way to do things and all you really have to do is repeat and mimic. So we might go back and say, okay, what if I change this? Sometimes it's just saying, so what if I change this to that? What are you gonna do now? And it's like, okay. So, so now, now we've gone deeper and we've just tweaked a little bit. So sometimes it's not as complicated as it sounds and sometimes it is complicated. It's a lot of the work that we do with the teachers on a daily basis and we're thankful for instructional coaches and resources from each other really to be able to do that. Does that yeah, that's great. Thank you. And it points to Ms. Uh, Ms. Glennon's and Mr. Bellicetti's point about the culture within the schools and the teachers and the willingness to learn and try new things because it is a lot harder and a lot more interactive in the classroom and yeah. uh, appreciate that, hearing that. Um, Ms. Petrowski. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted oh, to just sort of make one comment that I, um, that I see a big parallel between having kids help each other in the classroom mm -hmm. and having the teachers help each other learn HQI. And I think that modeling probably helps the kids be more comfortable with the concepts that we're putting out there. Other comments or questions? Yes, are we going to get the answer to answer to that? What if the answer was no? It's not fair. Talk to your peers. It's not fair. Is that right? That I know. One group gets more, right? Thank you very much. So that in seventh and eighth gets the most amount of kids. I know we're not going to get the answer. Yes, right? The last two people. It's 30 years from now. Thank you, Jamie. It's a great theater in English lit, sir. Right? The first one. Thank you. 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 Thank we got boxes. Yeah. 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 Just letting everyone get settled. I know that was an exciting presentation. <laughs> Just letting board members, before we get to the next item, uh, it just seems appropriate that we take a moment to recognize um, someone in the room that uh, has contributed to our school community at law for the last eight years, who we are going to be saying um, good luck and goodbye to. Um, V.J. Cerullo has um, served as the athletic director at law for, is it eight years? Yeah, ninth year now. This is eight the ninth year. Now. So uh, a couple things about V.J. I think um, very quickly, it doesn't take long to, when you first meet him to know that uh, he's just all about kids. Um, albeit it's a big job that has a lot to do with adults and kids, but um, in every situation I've seen and heard about V.J.'s interactions, uh, he's always able to recenter it. Um, and there's been a spirit at law um, for the last eight years of, of excellence, not just um, in athletics, but also academics. And I know that VJ helped uh, center um, the importance on 
uh, being both on and off the field um, uh, with a focus on, on excellence. Uh, VJ has uh, focused on developing character and integrity in each athlete, and it wasn't just about the win, uh, but the win from within so inside, and making sure that each athlete um, knew that they were winning regardless of the scoreboard at any time. Um, and I love the thinking, um, when I think of VJ's leadership there, uh, gosh, we've had so many great competitions there, right? Like great wins, great comebacks. Um, and VJ, when I think about your work there, I think about the champions that you've developed in our athletes, but the champions that they um, are in life. Uh, because not only have we seen great young men and women on the field, or on the court, or on the track, but uh, they're also leaders in their schools and in the community by the number of service and volunteer projects that they've head, head up. So, um, I like to think that VJU um, helped develop good members of the community. That uh, while your title was athletic director, um, you really just were a great um, young person developer, if we were gonna have a subtitle for your um, <laughs> title. So VJ, I, I told you uh, via text that the news killed me. Um, you are just such a great asset, but I am, I know that we'll be hearing about great things um, from you coming um, from that school down the waterway somewhere <laughs> down the coastline. I forget the name of it. Um, uh, but we wish you well, and you will be yes. sorely missed here in Milford Public School. So God bless. Thank you, Dr. Okay. And with that, I'll turn things over to our colleague, Mr. Vigitelli, for the Athletic Program Annual Financial Report. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vitalia. Uh, Mrs. Brennan, members of the board. Uh, the Athletic Financial Report is a little bit late this year. We normally do it uh, earlier in the, in the, uh, the board's calendar year, uh, but there were some <coughs> pressing things that were happening at the time. So uh, we're a couple of months late, but this is the uh, financial report for the 21-22 um, school year, and um, in addition to uh, our esteemed athletic director from Jonathan Law is our esteemed athletic director from the east side of town at Warren High School, Anthony Vitale. So um, everything that's in this report um, is pretty much supplied by the, uh, or in collaboration with the athletic directors. So uh, I want to thank both of them for, for their work um, in making the financials of the um, athletic program so successful. So, um, and as we go through the report, if I mess up on anything, you guys will be sure to let me know. They'll be happy to let me know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we'll go through it quickly. There's, there's really nothing new here um, that the board hasn't seen uh, in the past. The, um, the um, in Milford Public Schools, we uh, offer participation in 24 sports that are uh, sanctioned by the CIAC, Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic Conference, um, and one additional one, which is girls hockey, which for whatever reason is not overseen or sanctioned by CIAC. But so a, a total of 25 sports um, that we uh, have, that we offer to our student athletes. Um, great care and consideration, obviously, um, equity between the two schools. Uh, they're very much closely aligned, um, same league, you know, same, pretty much the same finances, and uh, we go to, we, we make sure that we go to great care to uh, provide a great athletic uh, experience for our student athletes on, on, at both high schools. Um, this report is the, the general review of financials. Um, there are many other aspects of the athletic program, but we're really concentrating on just the uh, financial pieces of the program for tonight. Um, so, the, um, in addition to the 25 sports that I spoke about, um, we also offer other um, athletic-related opportunities. And uh, just uh, to name a few, um, we have the Unified Sports um, Club, Powder Pump uh, Program, uh, and the Fencing Club, just to name uh, a few of them. Um, 
Unified Sports is a uh, registered program of Special Olympics. It partners students with intellectual disabilities with um, student athletes from the school uh, for training and competition. Uh, competition runs throughout the school year um, at the high schools and the middle school levels. And there's competition in soccer, basketball, volleyball, softball, wiffle ball, and bowling. I think that's the up-to-date list. Um, and there's approximately 80 to 85 students uh, district-wide that participate in unified sports. And it's a, a tremendous program. Um, powder Puff, we all, I'm sure you've all heard of the Powder Puff game. And um, this is the, the, the girls at the school participate in a uh, football game usually two nights before the annual Thanksgiving Day game, and it's a huge source of pride um, between uh, both of the schools for great competition. Um, and also the, uh, the event raises a pretty substantial amount of money, um, and that goes into the gate receipts uh, that we'll talk about in a second. So uh, I know everybody's sick and tired of talking about COVID, so we'll just touch on it for a second, but, but uh, obviously COVID did affect athletics and it did affect the finances um, of the athletic programs. In, in 1920, um, we got two thirds of the uh, seasons complete and then uh, in March 2020, um, everything came to a halt and spring sports were canceled that year. Um, you will see that there was pretty much a full gate that year because spring sports, we don't really charge a gate for, um, with, with a few exceptions. Um, the 1920 year, was, was, uh, there was no gate at all. Uh, football and wrestling were canceled altogether, and the other sports had an abbreviated season. Um, and because of that, uh, we did not uh, collect at the gate. So you'll see that reflected in the financial report. And then 21-22, um, we got back uh, to pretty much a full schedule. Although, um, if you recall back in 21-22, there were um, many contests that needed, or, or there were some contests that needed to be canceled because of you know, COVID um, and, and isolations that needed to take place on a particular team, uh, which necessitated uh, some shifting of the schedule a little bit. Uh, fortunately, 22-23 uh, is uh, a regular season, so we're in, we're in good shape um, this year as far as athletic goes. Um, the athletic finances um, are broken into two, uh, two different, we'll call it pots of money, but, um, w and also ways of accounting. It's the general fund, which is um, the, the numbers that you find in your general operating budget. And then, then there's the athletic activity account. Um, both of those accounts are carefully monitored, uh, both at the school levels um, and here at central office. And uh, um, are, all of those accounts are audited, um, which is required by law uh, through the city's annual audit. The, uh, the general fund, um, as I said, those items that, are, that can be found in your uh, operating budget Typically, the things that come out of that are coaches' salaries, transportation, athletic trainers, insurance, uh, equipment and supplies, and uniforms. Out of the activities account, um, this fund um, is pretty much funded in two ways. Uh, one is those um, dollars generated by ticket sales at athletic events. Um, and they generally pay for game day expenses such as game officials, uh, part-time staff, which are the ticket takers, um, the announcers, scorekeepers, uh, security, police officers, those kinds of things. Anything that um, is related to the game, the day of the game in that operation. Um, each year, the board has supplemented the athletic activities account uh, from the general fund, and that's broken out in your budget book, uh, to pay for game day operations because the ticket sales um, are just not sufficient uh, to keep up with the growing cost of each sport. So um, each year, the board has increased that amount because the costs continue to rise, but the gate has remained relatively stable, as we will see. So let's get into the numbers. Um, 
in the, uh, in the general fund. I, I've broken it out for the total expenditures. Um, you can see what each school spent um, out of its 8201 account, which is the general athletic account. And then you can see what the board has supplemented for uh, game day operations for both schools, which was $49,000 for both schools. Um, then you can see what each school spent, uh, pretty close. Um, hockey for boys and girls, as I'll explain later in the report, is a little bit different, so we break that out from the other sports, and we spent uh, 39000 on boys hockey and sixty-two fifty on girls hockey. For a total um, in the student athletic account, 8201 of $310,482. At other areas in the budget are some of the other things that we fund out of the general fund which are attributable to athletics. Uh, transportation at 228,000. Uh, coaches, um, account 1119, um, that's 575,591. The athletic trainers, we spent 119,075. And our athletic insurance um, for 38,790. So total general fund expenditures uh, were one million two seventy two two eighty seven. We won't spend too much time on the individual numbers, but of course, if any any questions that you have um, at the end of the report, I'm happy to answer. So, um, revenue from the athletic activities accounts um, in the uh, twenty one twenty two year uh, ticket sales amounted ninety eight thousand one hundred fifty six dollars. Um, the we um, supplemented 86,000 for game day operations. Um, and then there, there were no hockey participation fees because of COVID and because um, we just felt coming out of um, COVID and coming back to a regular season, but still having interruptions uh, that we did not charge the hockey participation fee uh, for uh, the 21-22 year. Uh, and then we also had um, donations, rebates, and royalties of 6648 And I always, I always like to mention that, yes, we do have royalties. Um, there, are, there is spirit wear um, that has, um, were copyrighted, and um, so they sell them in certain stores. I think Walmart is one of them, and uh, we do get rebates and royalties for that. So um, total in the uh, revenue, the revenue for the athletic activities account was 198.04. So then I broke out uh, the actual expenditures um, by category. So you can see the monthly amount we spent on the coaches, the transportation, how much we spent on officials. You know, I won't go through the whole list, but uh, but it's there uh, for you to take a look at. Um, how much we spent for each of the um, of, of the functions um, that put the athletic report, the athletic expenses together um, for a total of one million four thirty nine one oh five. So then, uh, just touching on ticket sales because it's it, this is it comes up every year. Um, when we use ticket sales, we're relying on. Um, the, a variable source of revenue to, to fund fixed costs. So what I mean by that is that the, um, the revenue that comes in from ticket sales can be greatly um, affected by many things, such as um, the weather, whether or not um, the, the success or not success of the team that year. Um, we saw this year uh, with both uh, schools having fantastic football seasons. Our gate receipts were up this year, so you'll, you'll see that reflected next year. So there's lots of variables that um, affect how much money you take in at the gate. But regardless of how many people pass through the gate and pay, the costs are fixed for that game. You still have the same amount of uh, referees, you have the same amount of ticket takers, scorekeepers, etc. Um, so the, the cost of game day operations continues to go up each year. Officials cost more, police officers cost more. Um, but we, as you'll see when we uh, go, when I show you the year to year gate receipts, uh, we're pretty much maxed out on what we are paying for, um, I'm sorry, what we're taking into the gate. Then uh, 
just a breakdown of the, the amount of money that we took in for each sport. And again, I won't go through each one, but obviously football you know, is, is our biggest money maker. Um, basketball, girls and boys basketball are, are next. Uh, hockey brings in a decent amount of money. And powder puff, actually, um, we, we get some money there from powder puff too. So you can see it broken down um, by the schools and both broken down by the individual sports. Then just the gate, re uh, gate receipt history, um, and, and this is what I mean about um, we're pretty much leveled out in what we take in. It's, it's approximately, uh, if you do the average, it's around $95,000 that we take in each year. Um, again, you saw the 2021 season where we, we where it was COVID and we didn't take in anything. Uh, but in 21-22, we're back up to um, our usual at $98,000. Then uh, student participation by sport. Uh, this is just the number of students at both high schools that participate in the individual sports. Uh, I put a little asterisk there each year. Um, swimming, boys swimming, um, there's not enough athletes at both schools to field two separate teams. So uh, we have a co-op team which CIAC allows, same as they do with hockey for girls and boys. So you can see a good, a good number of our um, students also participate in, in various sports. And then, um, <coughs> Dr. Novely and, and uh, Mrs. Swanson will be uh, very proud of me. I just did the division <laughs> and uh, divided the uh, the cost for each sport by the number of participants, and then you can you can see how much each sport costs us per year. And um, so, the uh, obviously again, football is the biggest. Um, but if you look at the next page. Um, it's not the most expensive because it has the most participants too. So obviously the fewer number of students uh, who participate, um, there's less, less um, division and therefore uh, the cost is greater. Um, so you can see boys and girls hockey are the most expensive uh, because there's not a lot of participants uh, and it costs a lot. And uh, another one is golf. Uh, golf is I think the next most expensive sport. Um, not that there's great cost for golf, but there aren't that many participants. So um, again, it's simple, simple mathematics and division, uh, which gives us the cost per student by sport. Um, I always mention because, as I said, boys and girls hockey is different um, because there aren't enough uh, student athletes at uh, both schools. We do have a co-op team. It's foreign law and plat tech. Um, it's administered by um, by BJ, the athletic director at uh, Jonathan Law, and um, the team is actually not the Milford Indians anymore. So I apologize, and uh, that will be corrected for for next year's report. What are we the Mariners? The Mariners now, the Milford Mariners. So I apologize um, for. My error there on this report. Um, uh, boys hockey, the uh, game day operations um, uh, are supplemented by ticket sales. Um, also, Plat Tech contributes $600 per player, so however many players they have, they contribute $600. Um, and uh, other expenses such as uniforms, equipment, are paid um, by the player participation fee. Um, this is just this is just an illustration. Um, I, I continue to put this in the slide each year um, because prior to the 2012-2013 season, um, the board. Uh, the, the board has increased its participation in, in boys and girls hockey um, since 2012-13. So you can see in that year, um, the participation fee was $850. And then when the board started contributing more, you can see that that came down each year. Uh, so it's relatively, um, I, I, 
won't say inexpensive, but it's much more um, less. It's less costly for the uh, the families to participate since the board's participation um, in hockey. Girls hockey. There's a, there's a little bit of a, of a story here. Uh, for a number of years, uh, Milford, the girls from foreign and law participated in the Notre Dame of Fairfield co-op team. Uh, in 2021, Andy uh, Fairfield uh, withdrew as the host. We took it over for one year, uh, but that really wasn't a sustainable model. And, uh, and so we joined the uh, Hamden co-op. And um, you can see that the, the teams <coughs> that participate in the, um, the, the, the co-op, and uh, that's a, it's a sustainable model for us. To have the girls participating. We provide transportation uh, to the Hamden Ray for the girls. You can see um, the, part the participation each year. Um, this is a down year. Uh, we're hoping to build it up again next year. Um, but there's the participation each year. And that about wraps it up. I'm happy to answer any questions. A quick overview of the finances of the athletic program. Questions, board members? Mr. DeYoung. Thank you. Um, a couple of quick questions, Mr. Mr. H. Kelly. Um, there's no receipts for track, baseball, or softball. Is that because we don't get attendance for those, or we just have never charged, or what's the reason behind that? Yeah, um, the athletic directors can, can chime in, but um, we don't charge for those, and really it's well, for baseball, it's it's um, it's hard. To, there's really no gate. It's it's an open field. Yeah. Um, there's so. You guys want to elaborate? Yeah, I would say that's exactly right. If the, if the facilities itself, um, especially baseball and softball, really don't allow for us to charge. There's so many different ways to get in and to places to watch the game. So it's really, so it's not like a football game where everybody's going into right. you know into one gate. Um, for track, I would say it, traditionally schools do not charge for track. I don't. In fact, I don't know of any that that do. So that's probably more of a past practice mm -hmm. thing than a facility issue. But baseball and softball would definitely be because of the facility. But track, I say, is another issue. Track is also so spread out. Right. Really, there's no way to follow people in into one one entrance. One spot. Okay. Yeah. Um, we do, we do for, in spring. Lacrosse is the only one, right? Yes. That we charge for. Okay. Uh, do we have any female golfers that play? We have uh, four and S three, three, and they just they all play together then. They play the boys and the girls play. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I have a somewhat unusual question. I don't know who to address it to either, Mr. Rich Tellier or you guys. Um, do we provide any? We we spend a lot of time on the board talking about professional development, professional learning for our our teachers, our administrators. Do what kind? Do we provide any for our coaches? And if so, you know, could you detail that a little bit for us? Sure, yeah, um, so three times a year we offer first aid and CPR okay. um, to our coaches because that's one of the requirements for them to be working with our kids. Um, we also um, ensure that they have the um, concussion refresher. So every coach has to take the Mod 15 co initial concussion course and then every five years a concussion refresher. So Mr. Ritali and I keep up on that to make sure the coaches are in compliance with that. In addition, each year we get um, taught at our annual conference professional development courses um, that we could provide to our coaches. So each year, Mr. Vitelli and I will, will offer one or two classes to our coaches each year. Um, usually, uh, Mr. Vitelli will offer the new one pretty soon in the spring, right after we get taught it, and then I'll follow up with, a, with the same one. So if they couldn't attend his, they attend mine in the fall, and then we'll offer one more during the course of the year as well. What, can you give us an example of what some a class that we might have taught was? Sure. Um, Better ways to, uh, like say, communication mm -hmm. with uh, with families and, and athletes. Um, uh, better ways to get kids involved with uh, inside the in, inside their community. Uh, best ways to uh, showcase students if they're going to go to the next level. You know, like NCAA eligibility things sure. like that. And then, um, what Mr. Shrill was saying, every coach has to take uh, 15 classes or 15 credits over a five-year period. So each of those classes, we 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 offer like point three, and over the five-year time, we'll keep their certification. That's great. Thank you so much, guys. Other questions? Yes, Mr. Irby. 
name is, challenge today. So. Is um, hockey the only sport that has a participa participation fee? Yes. Just because it's, it's an expensive sport? Correct. Ms. McDonough, Sousa. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chappelle, you have mentioned um, with regard to girls hockey that, uh, that I think you had said that next year you're going to try to increase participation. So how would one go about doing that? And also related to that, do you know why girls hockey is not overseen by the CIAC? Oh. Every, yeah, every sport that's uh, governed by the CAC mm -hmm. has to have a minimum amount of teams throughout the state. Okay. And right now the number for uh, girls hockey is still a little low. Like it, we had to co-op, um, we were with like four different schools. Mm -hmm. Last year we were with nine different schools. Wow. And we only had, we had 22 players. So it's really the numbers are still low. You know, hockey's a sport and I mean, I never really learned to skate. You can't just, it's hard to pick it up at high school. Like same as like gymnastics. You know, the people who are very, very good in that gymnastics have been doing that their whole life. It's a tough sport to, to pick up. So I think that's part of the reasons why the numbers are really low. Well. And as far as trying to get more student athletes involved, um, both Mr. Rytel and myself post a, an athletic information night for incoming uh, eighth, incoming ninth graders each spring, um, where we have all of our teams represented and do our best to, you know, get the word out that way and, and uh, you know, communication home and. Um, just making sure people are aware that we do offer girls ice hockey, not necessarily under the Gopher umbrella, but that we do offer it and provide transportation, et cetera. So um, it's really through communication um, that we're, you know, that we try to get more student athletes. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Ms. Doyle? Uh, Mr. Richard Telly, is part of the coaching line in the budget, uh, the athletic directors, are they included in that line item as well? Yes. Okay. Mr. Dion. Thank you. Just one other question that I was thinking about. Um, so a handful of years back, we supported uh, the inclusion of some middle school athletics <laughs> programs in the budget. Um, has that had an impact on participation? Where do we stand with that? Could, can you give us a, an update on that? Yeah, we, were, we were providing clinics through uh, our coaching staffs, and unfortunately, we were really getting the, getting the ball rolling with that, and COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And um, it really slowed down that process. Um, so it, it's it's unfortunately really stopped it, and it's something that um, you know we talked about. Um, it, it did. I think it did help. Um, at the very least, I think it allowed our families and our student athletes to connect with our coaches and to our student athletes as well, um, and develop those relationships before they got into the high school. Um, so you know it was it was successful at the time. Unfortunately, like I said, um, the restrictions that were in place really up, right up until this year made it impossible to continue it. So. Um, it really hasn't hasn't been in place since 2020, the spring of 2020. So do we have plans to bring it back? Yes. All right. Yes. It's included in the budget. It's okay. 20, 23, 24. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks, guys. Sorry. Ms. Duval. Um, students from the academy, can they participate in sports? Are they usually through law or foreign or where they live based in, in the district? They can participate on their, uh, with their home school. Okay. Great, thank you. I, I, just, I just wanted to mention one other thing because we were talking about girls and uh, with in, in golf and, and hockey also, but um, girls are starting to break into uh, wrestling, mm -hmm. right, Mr. Rytali? Can you? Uh, yes, you, you, uh, I think you just ha you held the tournament. Yeah, two weeks ago we held the first uh, all female tournament for the state of Connecticut, and we, um, you know, we it's the first time we did it, so we didn't know how many people we were going to get. Um, I spoke with Jim Rustelli and um, I spoke with the CAC and asked them if there was a possibility and uh, they, they thought it was a great idea. My coach, uh, David Esposito, really, he came up with the idea and uh, it's, it, was, it, was a, it was a great day. We were expecting, we didn't know really 80, 90 girls, we ended up with 132. Wow. And um, if you look across the uh, country, female wrestling in high school is, is the fastest growing uh, sport. And even like, like Sacred Heart started a women's team this year. So it is definitely, it was great to see them uh, compete that entire day. It was a really, really great day. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? All right. See none. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Richard Tully, if I may just say something, I was surprised by Dr. Gataya's words, so I wasn't prepared. So I thank you for that. But I would just like to thank everybody in this room um, for all of the support that they've given, uh, not only myself personally and professionally, but to the school and the administration, to the board, 
my friend Mr. Vitelli here helped me out um, over the years. Um, it's just been an honor to represent John Pallon, Milford Public Schools, and I'm going to miss everybody. And I know our coaches and our student athletes and our families appreciate the support as well, and I know they'll continue to receive it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and good thank luck. You. Thank you. All right, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Turn things over to Ms. Capazza for the HR report. Thank you. In my monthly report, you have the listing of job postings, personnel recommendations, retirements, resignations, terminations, and stipend appointments. It's a pretty straightforward report. Uh, nothing really to explain, um, except for one thing. We do have a number of teaching positions still available, you'll notice. Um, however, this time of year, we may also have some of the teaching positions maybe for next year, so I don't want you to be too alarmed. For instance, the French teacher on here is a listing for Jonathan Law for next year for a retirement that we already have in hand. So I just wanted to explain that. Questions from Ms. Uh, Mr. DeYoung. Thank you. Just wanted to ask about Mr. Cerullo and his position because, you know, we're coming into the spring season for athletics. Is, is he here through the end of the year or? He is not. He's okay. here, through, here through the end of the month. We posted the opportunity, the posting, I believe the posting closed. We've done a round one and a round two and we're kind of feeling our way through the interview process for that position. So it hasn't, sounds like it's been a little smoother than other positions. He did put in, I believe, more than a 30-day notice, so we had a little bit, a little bit more time. Not yeah. much, but um, yeah. So. so it should be somebody in place before the spring season? Or, um, or it's hard to say at this point, but we obviously hope, hope the sooner the better to get somebody in there. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Is that an internal position? Do you post it just internally, or are you, you interview we from outside it, the district yeah, as well? It, the best candidate internally or externally, yeah, that's quality we can find, we will grab. And do we have an active ED? When, if, if it's not immediately replaced or? I believe that we will, I'm not sure. Um, the administration may pick up some of the slack on that. I don't know okay. that we'll pull somebody out of the classroom to do that. There, so. are, there are really unanswered questions. We yeah. literally had another uh, round of interviews today, so we're at a point of having to make some decisions. So our elusiveness mm -hmm. is only suggesting we don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> For, For real, we don't know right? yet. Yeah. So. <laughs> this week, actually, we should know what's mm -hmm. happening. So. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Kapasna? Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Richard Kelly will take care of our disbursement report. Sure. Um, members of the board, in your package, um, as you know, you have a listing of the, the, all of the disbursements for the district for the month of January, uh, over the amount of fifteen hundred dollars. And normally we uh, highlight it in yellow, but for some reason I see it's highlighted in blue. So, but it, that, there's no, no difference. That, those are COVID-related expenses. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Mr. DeYoung? I, I think it must be the blue, Mr. Ricciatelli, that stands out to me because I'm sure this has been in here the whole time. Yes. Um, but the hot spots for distance learning. Are we, um, we're still funding those, and do we anticipate that we will just continue to fund those? Yeah, if I could defer to uh, Mr. J. Cola at the hotspots. Um, yeah, we're still currently using them. Um, I don't know the actual number. I, I, I know we have upwards of 200 of them, and I know there's probably about 120 out. Um, there was a lot that came back at the end of last year. Um, as you probably know, the, the state also has um, it, it's like, it's not a coupon, but like a thing that you can get, um, Optimum or uh, Frontier uh, through their program as well, so, so we lost a few that way. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't made the decision if we're going to continue it for next year yet. So the 45, I'm sorry? There still is a need. Yeah. Um, so the 4,500, that is just the hardware or is that also the service? No, that's the service. Oh, it's the just the service? Yeah, the hardware was free. Well, basically free at, at the beginning of COVID. Yes. Okay. So if we decide to continue the program, that'll be an ongoing cost. Correct. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> and are these are these hotspots that are actually being used for distance learning, or are they for uh, families that might not have internet access? They're for families that don't have internet access. Yeah. Other questions?
May I see none? Yes. Sorry, we were just no further questions. Thank you. And we're done with the superintendent's report. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to consent agenda. Ms. Petrosky. I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items, minutes for consideration for January 9th, 2023 business meeting, January 11th, 2023 special meeting, January 18th, 2023 special meeting. Is there a second? A second. Mr. Fowler has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Board comment. Have any board comment this evening? Ms. Doyle? He left, but I just wanted to say thank you to BJ as well. My three nieces and nephews all attend with Jonathan Law, and they are very sad that he will be leaving. It's always nice to go to the football games and the basketball games, and he's present and watching and available. Um, it's nice to see he'll be missed, but I'm sure we will find the right candidate. And uh, look forward to seeing that. Thank you. Board members, I inadvertently uh, missed liaison reports during the chair's report. So if anybody has any liaison reports, feel free to give them now. Right, Mr. Thank Fowler. You. Um, thank you, Ms. Glennon. Um, so the Permanent School Facilities Building Committee met on January 26th. Uh, Ms. Will, uh, Boynton and myself attended. Um, we're still waiting on supplies uh, to complete the hardened doors at Cat Pen and Live Oaks. Uh, but uh, Silver Petroselli representatives met with the fire marshal to discuss kind of alternative entrances to, um, to, uh, yeah, to allow kids to go into schools uh, safely. Um, the foreign roof project, we're, um, we're, we're waiting on the receipt of the grant commitment. It's, uh, we submitted it. And Pumpkin Delight, um, it looks like all the walls, uh, footings and foundations have been poured. Um, those are just, and the students are still do documenting the, the, the development of the project. Oh, nice. so. <laughs> Um, is there an ETA for the supplies for the hardened doors, or is it uh, up in the air? Still? Yeah, it's just, um, it, they're still okay. waiting to hear. Yeah. Several months, they, yeah. they said. Okay. There's supply chain issues. Any other board comment or liaison reports? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion mm -hmm. to adjourn. Is there a second? A second. Anybody opposed to adjourning at 8.50? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you for the committee of the whole meeting in two weeks.